So one of the things that I really like to do as a pastor are weddings. It's one of my favorite services, but that isn't true for a lot of pastors. Many don't like the extra work, the extra counseling, the potential bridezillas, the mothers, the mother-in-laws, the pesky wedding coordinators, all of that that adds to uh, putting together a wedding. But the truth of the matter is I would rather preach a hundred funerals instead of a hundred weddings. Why is that? Well, because one of the audiences is hurting and ready to hear some words of comfort. The other audience is only thinking about the party to come and really don't care too much about what I have to say, except uh, let me introduce to you Mr. and Mrs. So, -and -so. so I hope you understand my analogy because this theme is going to be running through my sermon. Wedding people who want to get to the party, funeral people who want to hear some words of comfort and grace. We often find ourselves in certain situations in some days where we are more open to hearing God's words and God's promises and in situations or other days where we're really not so open, we're too distracted or we're not quite prepared to have our ears completely open. This is what we encounter in our gospel lesson today, encountering Jesus and his sermon on the plain, as it's called in Luke's gospel. We need to take notice of the contrasts that are playing out. The contrast between the geography of where Matthew's Beatitudes were delivered and Luke's Beatitudes are delivered, the contrast in the audience, the contrast of what it means to be blessed. Let's begin by comparing these two famous sermons that Jesus gave, Matthew's Sermon on the Mount, Luke's Sermon on the Plain. Biblical scholars suggest that there's a theological emphasis in the location of the two sermons. Between Matthew's emphasis that it happens on the mountain, Luke's emphasis that it happens on a level place. You see, the mountain was the place of piety. It's where Jesus would retreat from everyone to pray, to be in communion with God. In Matthew, Jesus gathers his disciples on the mountain and he gives a lengthy sermon to them. We get the sense that it's just to his disciples that he's preaching. Uh, he's up there delivering his sermon for three chapters in Matthew, Matthew 5 to Matthew 8, before he comes down the mountain to continue his ministry. In Luke, Jesus gathers his disciples and they come down the mountain. He gathers his twelve. He gathers the other disciples, the other followers. There's also these people from Jerusalem and Judea, the coast of Tyre and Sidon. And he delivers the sermon among the people. The significance of coming down the mountain is one of emphasis in Luke. In Luke, Jesus comes down to be among the people, the poor, the Gentiles. The rabble who have come because they've heard the rumors about Jesus. So while Matthew has Jesus delivering his sermon on the mountain where God resides, Luke is, has Jesus delivering his sermon down where the people reside. We cannot miss that point. That's a significant point. But the theological emphasis goes beyond location. Matthew's gospel, the entire gospel of Matthew, was written more for a Jewish community. Therefore, his beatitudes are more spiritualized. They're given more sense that God is speaking law uh, like Moses giving the people the written and the oral law when he comes down the mountain that he receives on top of the mountain. Matthew's gospel, it says, blessed are you who are poor in spirit. Matthew's gospel says, blessed are those who hunger for righteousness. It's as if Matthew is making that point that Jesus is the prophet to replace Moses, the greatest prophet. He's not only the replacement for Moses, he is the long-awaited Messiah. For Luke, however, his gospel is sent, his gospel was written more for a Gentile Jewish community, and as such, once he receives his instructions from God on the mountain, he comes down to be among the people and deliver his message to the people. It's good news for all people. Jesus is the Son of Man. And what 
about the people that Jesus is among in Luke's gospel? Who is he delivering this sermon to? The audience is made up of his 12 disciples. It's made up of the other disciples who are followers. And then we have the people from Jerusalem and Judea, the coastland of Tyre and Sidon, which would be a mix of Jews and Gentiles. And so if you look at this group, you can really see it broken up into two groups, the followers and the seekers, those who are looking for some hope in their lives. In other words, you have the insiders, you have the outsiders. Now, I've preached on this dichotomy before, how insiders are the ones that have some sense of knowing, what we call it gnosis, you know, as the Gnostics would call it. They kind of know how things are to run and how things are supposed to be. It's a secret knowledge of how the world, how the church, how God acts. In Jesus' time, the Jews were the insiders, the Gentiles were the outsiders. The outsiders, of course, have no clue about how things are supposed to be. They're just looking for something different. They might be seeking to have some sense of community. They may have to be seeking of a sense of what the insiders have. If you think about my opening analogy, the wedding people and the funeral people, the insiders are the wedding folk, right? They know what's going on. They just want to get to the party. The outsiders are the funeral folks. They're worried about their lives, and they're looking for some words of hope and grace and good news. So we know the geography. Jesus is down among the people. We know the, the crowd, right? Insiders and outsiders. So what's the message? Luke includes not only blessings, but he gives a series of woes as well. The blessings and the woes come in a sense of four discernible states of being. The rich versus the poor, the filled, full versus the hungry, the weeping versus the laughing, the hated versus the beloved. And here's where the engine goes off the rails for the insiders. What Jesus has to say about these states of being come with the authority of Moses, but those words will be received by the insiders sort of like the prophets Jeremiah, Amos, and Isaiah. Those prophets were ridiculed for their message because it was a message of doom and destruction for the Jews. Jesus' sermon lays out a message about God's kingdom, but it's not necessarily good news for the insiders, is it? It reverses what is understood, understood about the Jewish understanding of blessedness. Who were the blessed? Who were the makairos? That's the Greek word. Who were the blessed in, from the Old Testament Jewish perspective? Those who were blessed were those who were blessed with happiness and money and property and contentment and power. They were the elite, the upper crust, the rich, the powerful, those considered to be living in a state of righteousness because God had blessed them with all of their stuff. In other words, if you were part of the haves, you were blessed by God and you were considered an insider. You with me? If you were part of the have-nots, you were an outsider. An ordinary presence, somebody that God had not blessed. So you think of those four pairings of those states of being. Who were the blessed? Who were the insiders loved by God? In the Jewish perspective, it would have been the rich, the full, the laughing, and the beloved, right? The ones who were not living under God's blessings, that would have been the poor, the hungry, the weeping, and the hating. Back to my wedding and funeral analogy, which group do you imagine would have been hanging on those words that Jesus preached that day? The outsiders, right? The funeral folk, the ones who needed to hear some good news of hope, would have hung in every word. It would have given them some existential hope for the future. For the insiders, the wedding folk, the ones who thought that their wealth their fullness, their happiness gave them an automatic ticket to the wedding feast in the kingdom of God, they would have suddenly experienced some real existential angst at Jesus' words. So what can we take away as 21st century Christian Americans today? 
What can we take away from this text, those of us that live in such wealth and prosperity and earthly blessings? What good news is there for us? Is there any grace for us in this text? Well, there is, and it comes in understanding that this text defines two things for us. It defines what the kingdom of God is like. It defines what true discipleship is supposed to be. The ways of God's kingdom are not defined by human aspirations or appearances. In other words, we always must remember Jesus' teaching about the first shall be last, and the last shall be first. Those who have on earth cannot automatically assume that their earthly blessings will mean heavenly blessings. Being rich and full and happy and beloved by human standards gets us very little in God's kingdom. So the real emphasis for us should be on our discipleship. And now I might be going off the rails a little bit with this teaching, but let me ask you some questions. What are you hungering for right now in your relationship with God? How is your faith poor right now? Why is it poor? Are you weeping right now because of your relationship with God or weeping about your relationship with your neighbor? Who do you hate right now? And how is that relationship interfering with your relationship with God? I want to break one of the rules of homiletics this morning and introduce a new text right towards the end of my sermon. I'm not supposed to do that, but it's worth the risk of losing your attention and the fact that these blowers are making it so hot and you're all falling asleep. But Remember the parable of the publican and the Pharisee from Luke 18? The Pharisee would be the one from the class of people who believed they were the wedding people, right? They were confident. He was confident in his righteousness and his presence at God's table. He looked down upon others. He showed up to the temple in the presence of that tax collector, that publican, and he prayed, thank God I'm not like others, like that publican, that tax collector. He's an unrighteous fool. I fast two times a week. I tithe. Whereas the tax collector, the publican, he can't even look up. He looks at the floor. He beats his breast and he says, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Now, how would each one of those persons, how would they have heard Jesus' sermon on the plain? What, am I, what point am I trying to make? My friends, discipleship means never assuming that we know enough. It's never assuming that there's nothing more that there is for us to do. Never assuming that we can sit on our behinds, laughing all the way to God's kingdom, towing our you all possessions behind us. Amen? We should be considering ourselves always poor in understanding, always asking God for guidance with the help of the Holy Spirit because God continues to surprise us with what God is doing in our lives and in the world. When we consider ourselves poor in understanding, it compels us to learn more, to go to God more often, seeking the power of the Holy Spirit to guide us and to give us or increase our faith. We should always be hungry for the word, the word preached, the word spoken, the word read. It's what guides us in faithful living. We should be weeping for the state of our nation, if not the state of the world, my friends. It seems God's losing the battle right now. But with our help, God is going to win the war. And finally, we shouldn't be deterred from faithful, active discipleship, even if it means others will make fun of us, will hate us, or misunderstand our priorities. Doing the, bus the business of kingdom building on this earth will often make the insiders uncomfortable. Kingdom work is good news for the outsiders who are aching for someone to bring them some good news some hope, 
some news that someone cares about. And that someone is Jesus Christ. And the disciples who share that good news. Now are the insider wedding party people, the rich, the full, the laughing, the beloved, are they on the outs with God? Of course not. But if your life is happy and comfortable now, comfortable not just by American standards, but by the world's standards, then we need to listen for God's voice and teachings that much more. Because we risk appearing to others and to God looking like the Pharisee from my example, thinking that we are better than others. But that's what earthly standards and earthly living can do to us. It takes us out of the reality of how the entire world lives. Forgetting how many people are hungry, how many people are poor, how many people are weeping, and how many people are hated. Truth be told, my friends, we're all Pharisees once in a while, right? That's why we need the words of Jesus. They are the words of eternal life for all people, rich and poor, hungry or full. My friends, God's love and God's grace is sufficient. Amen? Amen. Hey, John, can you just turn those blowers off? Thank you, sir. It's the green, the green switches. Thank you. I feel like I run a marathon. Wow. Are you hot? Oh, you're good looking, though. I'll say that. Um, I'm sorry. I'm just I lost. Thank you. Five seventy-four. Uh, we'll do verse three, the last verse. Five seventy-four. Thank you, John. 